just joining us. This is the Weekly Space Hangout, and I am not Fraser Kane. Our, our wonderful leader is um, off currently enjoying a much-deserved vacation in Europe with his family, and we wish him the best. We, we last heard he is in the Louvre today, and um, while he is off enjoying France, we will do our best to bring you the latest in science news. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce the, the rest of our science team to you. So going from left to right on my screen, we have uh, Alan Boyle from MSNBC. We have Nancy Atkinson, who's senior editor at Universe Today. We have Nicole Gugliucci, who's uh, from uh, Discovery News. And I'm Pamela Gay of uh, Astronomy Cast. And um, so it's been a kind of awesome news week. Um, lots of different things coming from, from all over the place. And I'm going to start with, with Alan. So what exciting news <laughs> do you have that you want to bring to us today? Well, let's see. Uh, we can start with the uh, Titanic movie. Titanic came out in 3D. And uh, for years, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the uh, director of the Hayden Planetarium, has been uh, ribbing James Cameron over the fact that he got the stars wrong that uh, there's this scene where, where Rose and Jack are kind of uh, waiting for rescue on this plank. Jack has to be uh, floating in the water. It's getting pretty cold, and Rose is looking up at the stars. Very dramatic scene. Uh, only thing is that they basically just computer generated some random stars and mirrored them. And uh, usually, this is the sort of thing that happens all the time. And usually, you wouldn't make all that much about it. But uh, for James Cameron, uh, his, the image that people have of him is that he is just such a perfectionist that every detail, especially about the Titanic, uh, has to be just right. And so uh, Neil uh, noticed that that the stars really didn't make sense in this scene. and, and uh, People are, were almost getting sick of uh, him bringing this subject up anytime he talked about what Hollywood has gotten wrong about astronomy. And uh, James Cameron got sick of it as well. <laughs> and so for the reissue of Titanic in 3D, uh, they went back and they fixed the stars. They said, OK, Neil, uh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I can say that on Google, right? Yes, uh, you can. Okay, good. So th he said, uh, "You tell me what the stars looked like at 4:20 in the morning, and I'll put that in the movie." And and by gosh, that's what happened. And and so uh, this. Uh, got to be a big deal because Cameron brought it up in the interviews. This was the only thing that he changed uh, from the original issue of Titanic in 1997 to this new 3D reissue. And, and so uh, it's a really interesting story about how if you're persistent enough and you happen to have a, a TV show and a nice lecture tour circuit to, to go on, you can actually make Hollywood uh, see the light and get the science right. And, and so it's kind of a fun little story. Uh, when we put it up on Cosmic Log this week, we got a lot of comments saying, well, what about the other 99% of the movie? When are they going to fix that? But uh, no, it's, a, it's a fun thing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you happen to look up, uh, you might get a good view of the Big Dipper while, while you're watching uh, Titanic in 3D. So that's fun. Another thing, uh, and I actually have some uh, audio visual uh, to uh, do for this one is that uh, there were some researchers in Britain at the University of Southampton who uh, actually did some simulations of what sounds might uh, sound like on other planets. And so um, they did uh, various natural sounds. They did what the sound of your voice might be on Mars or on Venus. Uh, the lead researcher in this said that uh, if you were talking on Venus and you didn't mind having you know, uh, sulfuric acid coming down on you while you were speaking in this uh, mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere, you would sound like a bass-voiced smurf because uh, the theory was that the atmospheric qualities of Venus would give you a lower uh, frequency to your voice than you otherwise would have. And also, it would make you sound bigger 
just because of the uh, fluid dynamics. And so what they did is that they uh, actually uh, took some natural sounds from Earth, like a waterfall, and I'm going to see if this works here. Okay, that's a waterfall on Earth. And then they did the simulation to see what, what it would sound like on Titan. So uh, I, I like this one the best of all the simulations they did. It sounds like uh, it's a computer <laughs> going off, but uh, that's, you know, what they say that the dynamics of the, of the smoggy Titan atmosphere would do to natural sounds. So it's not just an academic uh, exercise because eventually uh, NASA is going to want to send probes to Titan to go down through the atmosphere and uh, they're probably going to want to put a microphone on there to try to capture the sounds that are propagated through an alien atmosphere and uh, see if they can use that to actually pick up phenomena that will be worth investigating. And they tried to do that with Mars. In fact, the Planetary Society put a microphone on uh, the Mars Polar Lander, and uh, this was a project that they did with UC Berkeley. But unfortunately, uh, Mars Polar Lander was lost uh, in 1999, and another mission that they hoped to put it on was canceled. So we still haven't really gotten the true sounds of what, uh, what another uh, atmospheric environment would sound like. And, and, but one of the, these days we're going to do it, and the simulation that these guys in uh, University of Southampton did may help pave the way for it. Uh, people who go to a planetarium show uh, in Hampshire, in Britain, uh, will be able to hear those sounds as part of the planetarium show. They say they're getting a lot of interest from other planetariums uh, to do this sort of thing, and so it, uh, the sounds of Titan, Mars, and Venus may be coming soon to a planetarium near you. That, that's all. Oh. I'll yeah. I'm having button fail today. Sorry. That that's all <laughs> really wonderful. Is is there some place online that people can uh, download these different sounds if they want to hear them for themselves? Funny you should mention that. That uh, as part of the item that I did for MSNBC on CosmicLog.com, you can go there and, and we actually have 15 sounds of all varieties there, and you can uh, click them. They're WAV files. You can download them by right clicking. You can just listen to them online. And and uh, actually, uh, they did the different voices on different planets. And, and I didn't really find that there is all that much difference. The waterfall was the thing that, that really I found the most interesting. But uh, they also have the, thunder, the sound of thunder, as it might sound on Mars, as well as the sound of a Martian dust devil. And uh, I think that we'll be talking more about dust devils uh, as the show goes on. But uh, if you want to hear what a dust devil might sound like on Mars, Give it a go on CosmicLog.com. That, that was actually a really perfect segue to our next story. So I'm, I'm going to trans transfer things over to Nancy Atkinson and a dusty bad day on Mars. <laughs> well, if you recall from all the images that we've gotten back from the Mars Exploration rovers, there were certain seasons when the, dust, when the rovers could actually capture dust devils kind of skirting their way across Mars' surface right in front of the rovers. And uh, right now is obviously the right season for these dust devils to, to take place in the northern hemisphere of Mars anyway. Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been capturing some really huge dust devils that are visible even from orbit. And the first one um, took place a couple of weeks ago and uh, everyone got so excited about it because this was one of the first dust devils that had been captured from orbit. And it was, uh, it was fairly big. It was uh, about 800 meters or about a half a mile high. Uh, not all that wide really. And, uh, you know, uh, there was, as I said, there was lots of excitement about it. But now we know that uh, this was just chump change. This uh, week, MRO's team came out with a, a new image of a really huge Martian dust devil. And they said it was probably about 20 kilometers or about 12 miles high. Um, it's only about as wide as a, about half of a football field, half of a football field, but still, that is absolutely huge. Now, this, this image was taken uh, during the late northern spring, uh, actually two weeks short of the northern su summer solstice, and uh, this is a time when, when the ground or the soil in the northern mid-latitudes is, is really being heated strongly by the sun, and that's uh, 
the kind of conditions that are just right for creating dust devils. Now, in, in my articles, uh, uh, both of the articles actually, uh, readers kind of took me to task because I was calling this a tornado or a twister, and I admit to a little artistic license there, but um, the difference between tornadoes and dust devils are that tornadoes are actually created from clouds and, and uh, you know, cold and warm fronts coming together creates, uh, creates conditions right for tornadoes. Of course, we don't have that on Mars. Um, dust devils are spinning columns of air and uh, they're visible because they kind of pull dust off of the ground and there's obviously a lot of dust on Mars. And, uh, and unlike tornadoes, dust devils form on a clear day when the, when the ground can be heated by the sun. So no clouds when there's dust devils. But uh, uh, stunning images, uh, both of them really, really neat. Um, on, the, on the first one, JPL came out with a kind of a, a really neat animation of how you could see the dust devil from different angles and that kind of thing. So I'm hoping they do that for this large one as well. That, that's all wet, the reason to make sure that we have um, uh, weather stations when we start putting colonies on Mars. You can just imagine having, instead of the tornado sirens we have here, dirt sirens there. Now, I know you have another story, but I actually want to stay on weather for a few more minutes. So I'm going to move things over to Nicole, who uh, has a bad day at Alma to talk about. Hi. Okay. Um, yeah, Alma is, so I, of course, live in, in Charlottesville, which is, you know, Alma's town. It's the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is being built in Chile, um, and it's a sub-millimeter millimeter array that is, um, was, you know, they picked um, this site in Chile that, uh, in the Atacama Desert, because they have, you know, only 30 cloudy days a year and it hardly ever rains. Um, and the reason you want to do this for this, this, this is kind of at the high frequency end of radio astronomy, is that um, water um, absorbs light at these frequencies. And so water vapor in the atmosphere is a bad thing. So, of course, they have been recently hit with all kinds of ridiculous um, storms, thunderstorms, rain, snow, mudslides, and all kinds of insanity, um, just as the telescope is starting to come online. Um, they're in uh, what's called cycle zero right now, which is uh, preliminary. A lot of the preliminary science proposals are being done since the, the array isn't, um, isn't, isn't finished yet. I'm going to put the link in the thing, in the comments, so you can uh, go, see, go take a look at um, the picture of this ridiculous sandstorm just closing in on these teeny little tiny uh, radio antennas, which are not that tiny, of course. Um, and it looks like something out of, um, what was that movie with Brendan Fraser? The, 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 mummy. the mummy, thank you. The mummy, like the, the sandstorm with the face and the rock's face comes out. It, it's, it looks kind of like that. Um, so, uh, Unfortunately, the, there's been damage to the local town and some of the infrastructure buildings, but the antennas themselves haven't been damaged. Um, but, of course, you're at a remote site, uh, which is, is something I've had experience with where, if you, uh, uh, like said, they say, um, one of the engineers says later in the article, you know, if you need a screw, you have, you know, a certain type of screw, you have to drive 100 miles to get the screw um, if, if you don't have uh, enough extra parts to do repairs. So they are monitoring that situation pretty closely. Um, and, I, and I think this is, it's a little scary because um, a lot of these, um, I know some of these uh, major weather events can be contributed to climate change. Um, it's hard to, uh, you know, align any one event and say this was climate change related, but um, the, the frequency of, of extreme weather events is increasing. Uh, and astronomers have been picking particular sites because they have nice weather, and if they're not having nice weather, that's, um, you know, something that's uh, becoming a problem for these, these telescopes that are coming online in the coming decades. Um, so it's interesting to watch. Thankfully, uh, you know, there hasn't been any major reports of injuries or anything, um, but the telescopes uh, have to watch out for crazy weather. So, so you may see me and Nicole signaling each other. I'm actually going to let all of you in on the secret right now, which is the reason I had to pull my headphones out while she was talking, is we're currently both sitting in the exact same room, and, and there's, there's her significant other. And, and I, I have just learned that the latency between 
uh, her computer going to the wireless coming to my computer is, is about half a second, and, and that makes listening over the microphones a bit torrential. Um, so so I, I'd like to stay back on the planet Earth for a little bit longer and go back to you, to you, Nicole, and you were talking about site selection, and there's actually some pretty significant site selections going on right now. So can, can you tell us about the trials and tribulations and Song of Solomon going on with um, the selection of SKA? Switch. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the the square kilometer array. Um, so of course, uh, I'm I'm all radio astronomy all the time these days because um, I'm trying to write my thesis. Ha! Huh. But uh, the square kilometer array is is a big radio telescope that's that's being designed and built, and it's this concept of getting a square a full square kilometer of co of collecting area. So you've got thousands and thousands of of of, of radio telescopes um, working together as one array. Uh, and so this this is a big international project that has been in the planning stages for many years. Um, and they are um, honing down on a selection for the site for this big radio telescope that's supposed to start construction in the 2020 time frame. Um, and so in order to avoid, so just as, you know, op optical visual astronomers have to avoid light pollution, radio astronomers have to avoid RFI or radio frequency interference. And so cell phones and wireless and all of that stuff, just radio stations, we try to get far away from it as possible. Um, so the two candidate sites are, one is in the Karoo Desert in South Africa, and the other is in, um, in Murchison, uh, Western Australia. Um, and so these two sites have been competing to host the Square Kilometer Array, and they both have prototype telescopes, and they both have project teams, and, and all this cool science already starting. Um, and a couple weeks ago, I think, the Science Advisory Board, um, I should, full disclosure is uh, I work for the paper project, which is at the South Africa site, so I, I have collaborators on the South Africa side. Um, so, you know, yay, Karoo, I love them. But, uh, <laughs> um, the, the Science Advisory Board selected the South Africa site as um, the, uh, uh, over a slight mar by a slight margin over the Australia site as their preferred place to put this big multi-million multi-billion dollar international telescope. Um, so, but the the uh, SK partners have gotten together and they're meeting this week. Uh, talking about, uh, so where are we actually going to put this telescope? If the Science Advisory Board says, you know, South Africa, but you, we have vested interests in Australia as well. Um, so one of the things that is, is being discussed is something that I, I am proud to say I've been predicting for years, but, you know, <laughs> it's because I'm cynical sometimes, um, is that they're going to, they, they're talking about uh, involving both sites, uh, the South Africa site and the Australia site, um, in, in having kind of splitting SKA between the two sites. Uh, one way that this could be done, this is not coming from them, this is coming from my own speculation, um, is that um, to cover all the frequency bands or you know, all the radio colors that you want to, you can't do it all with the same dish design. And so there may be a low frequency and a high or a low, mid, and high frequency. Um, so one possibility is to is you could split those um, fairly easily. Um, it wouldn't be ideal to have half the array in one place and half in the other um, for, for various reasons um, and, and trying to use them in tandem. So there's talk of splitting, splitting the, the array between the two sites to make everyone happy and, and politically sound. Um, and they're both gorgeous, quiet, uh, you know, no, no human interference sites. So they're both good scientifically. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to watch the politics unfold for this big multinational project. So that that's absolutely awesome. Um, it, it's not good for the, it, it's a great insight into the, the chaos that is site selection at, at times. And it was actually Alan that, that made the, the very interesting observation that they're basically <laughs> dividing the child Solomon style. And I was wondering if you had anything uh, extra that you wanted to add to this story. Oh, I was just going to note that uh, that uh, the Australian uh, folks have teamed up with New Zealand as well, and and uh, there's a story about how uh, Australia and South Korea did some sort of uh, radio uh, interferometry experiment, and so the Australians are really trying to you know uh, sell their site uh, as well, and and so it's not 
really that unusual for uh, people with a big science project to try to figure out how to divvy things up. For example, with the uh, ITER uh, fusion project, uh, it, was, it came down to Japan versus Europe basically France. And so what they did is that they determined that the fusion facility itself would go in France, but that they would have a data center in Japan to, to take care of all the data processing. And so uh, that's, uh, and you, you often find that to be the case with military projects as well. Boeing might get part of a, a fighter project and Lockheed Martin might get the other. Uh, so uh, it, it Nicole is uh, right on with uh, thinking that they're going to try to find some way to have at least a consolation prize for probably Australia to, to come out of this. Uh, but it, it will be interesting to see how the politics of all this works when it gets right down to it. I think that they're supposed to kind of resolve this over the next month or two, and, and so we may not hear immediately what the resolution is going to be, but uh, that's probably what they're going to be doing is going back and doing all the politicking to, to work this out. It, uh, it can compare it to um, a project that, uh, when I first started in radio astronomy, people were talking about building LOFAR, which is a low-frequency telescope in the Netherlands. Um, but at the time, the site selection was between the Netherlands and the Western US and Australia. Um, and the project ended up breaking up partly because of site selection issues. Um, and the Netherlands part of LOFAR has continued, and, and they're building a, a great facility out there. Um, but watching that project actually break up, because I was at, I was on the U.S. collaboration side of that, um, watching, watching that separate into different telescopes um, was interesting. Um, and I think ALMA also, um, the antennas, some of the antennas were built by the U.S. and some were built by Europe and some were built by Japan because um, that was part of the agreement in getting all the collaborations together. Um, but Chile, Chile, of course, got the site. <laughs> And, and this isn't a, a purely radio astronomy pro problem. We're, we're also seeing with, um, originally there were these huge designs for these uh, tens of meter telescopes. And, and now you're seeing designs settling down for a 30 meter. Um, and, and you hear talk of both the European uh, 30-ish meter and then a US one. So there, we're looking at the overwhelmingly large telescope and the extremely very large telescope just to have boring acronyms continued into the future. Uh, so so this, is, this is a problem we see all across astronomy is everyone wants their toys and they don't want to share them necessarily and they want them local and they want them where their grad students can work on them. Um, but in, in some ways this also means more toys for all of us to play with. So, so there are there are benefits now and then to having all of these disagreements. Now, just to leave home for a little while, we're looking to put people into space in the future. And Nancy, you have some great destination ideas. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that those of us that went to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference um, two weeks ago are still working on uh, the wealth of information that we got and still working on creating articles on that. Since Emily Lakdawalla plugged my article last week on the, on the Weekly Space Hangout about uh, channels on Mars and how they were formed, I wanted to mention her article that she published, uh, I believe, at the end of last week about a uh, talk by Dave Minton and uh, talking about how Saturn's moons can tell us about comets. And basically he said that the objects that struck the moons of Saturn um, that make to make the craters on those moons uh, mostly came from the Kuiper Belt and not the main asteroid belt. And it's a really interesting article that, that Emily has. Um, uh, today, I was able to do a, a podcast for the NASA Lunar Science Institute and also for the 365 Days of Astronomy um, based on an interview I did um, at LPSC. And I talked to Kirby Runyon, who's a, a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, he interned at the... Uh, um, the the lunar uh, I can't remember where he was anyway he was at the uh, the lunar institute in in Houston and uh, he came up with a really great place to go on the moon and normally when people talk about going to some of the um, polar regions of of the moon they usually mention Shackleton Crater well he talked uh, Kirby talked about going to Amundsen Crater and he said that that was just a much better location, both logistically, um, scientifically, 
uh, pretty much uh, hands down it was just a better place to go than, than Shackleton Crater. So um, take a listen to the podcast. It's on 365 Days of Astronomy and also on the NASA Lunar Science Institute podcast page. And I also hope to be uh, writing an article about it for University Today because it's pretty interesting. So look for that later on. And, and the one final piece of late breaking news that, that I think we, we have to acknowledge is the Kepler mission got extended until 2016. And <laughs> this is truly an, an awesome thing. Um, so, so the fact that it was extended, it's kind of hard to, to turn a lot of, um, yes, we, we can root and cheer, but that, that itself uh, isn't new science. But what's awesome is by extending the mission to 2016, they're able to look for objects that have larger and larger orbital periods. The thing with Kepler is in order for them to say they've found a planet, they have to detect it three times transiting in front of a star. So the first time it goes in front, that could be a glitch. Second time it goes in front, it's like, ooh, now I think I know how often this happens. But you have to have that third predicted correct periodicity passing in front in order to say, yes, there's a planet there. Well, with going out to 2016 that extends us to be able to look for things that have larger than Earth orbits for a change. It allows us, if we got unlucky with something, you can imagine that it transited the day before Kepler started taking data and, and so we wouldn't notice the first transit until the mission's already basically a year in. Um, it also allows us to say with more confidence what's going on in systems that have many different planets that, that you end up with confusion factors because of the multiple transits taking place. Um, do, does anyone have any, any additional information that they want to add to the, the 2016 Kepler story? Okay, so happy, a happy woo to all the mission scientists. Um, now, I, I asked out in the comments if anyone had any questions. Um, and so, so uh, Leon Denniston is asking, does RFI, uh, does RFI scale with interferometry and telescope size? Uh, switch. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, you're, as, as you get a bigger radio telescope, you're more sensitive, and so you can see fainter and fainter things. Um, and so for, for the project that I work on, we have a prototype in West Virginia that can see you know, a digital TV station in Richmond. Um, and so with these really sensitive telescopes, um, you have to just you know, surround yourself as po much as possible by desert and, and anything that will block uh, man-made radiation. Um, one of the things that you find out when you do that, and this is uh, stories I've heard from the site testing for the SKA, is that once you get far enough away from all of these um, you know, typical sources of RFI, and you have a really sensitive telescope, a really big telescope, you find um, unexpected sources of interference, and most of it, you, you, the astronomers and the engineers, are creating it. So all the electronics you have on site are giving off interference, and you have to shield those properly. Um, People walking around make static electricity and, and you know, cameras, flashes, everything um, gives off, seems to give off some kind of radio interference. Um, and so as, as we dig deeper and deeper into that um, with a bigger telescope, that, yeah, you, you, you get to see a lot more of it. Interestingly, though, if you have an interferometer, which is, you know, multiple telescopes, you can cancel out some of that. Um, but if you have one big dish like Arecibo, um, that's just going to pick up everything. And, and the neat way that they're able to cancel this out is actually because light travels at a finite speed and the telescopes are separated. You can actually see in sequential order each of the different telescopes picking up the, the artificial signals that we need to get rid of. So multiple dishes does have advantages, but it also, we're on a planet with humans who make noise in all colors of light apparently. Uh, which is just an odd way of thinking about it. So, so we also have uh, Stefan De Decker is is asking, how is Ice Hunters going? When will people be able to look for KBOs? So, for those of you who don't know, Ice Hunters was a project uh, sponsored by the New Horizons mission that was part of the Zooniverse collection of citizen science projects, and it ran up until we ran out of objects, or we ran out of images, rather, in January of 
of 2012. And over the course of the about six months that the project was live, uh, 30 different Kuiper Belt objects were discovered by the people in Ice Hunters. And last week, we submitted 530 names uh, to the Minor Planet Center. We're waiting to get feedback on all of the objects. And, and so it was a highly successful project. Well, moving forward, the New Horizons team is actually moving their, their discovery project out of the Zooniverse and into CosmoQuest, where we have all of this educational scaffolding and things like the weekly hangouts. So if you want to keep searching for ICE, um, right now, as we're in the process of recording this, my programmer is in the process of uploading the brand new data. And there's currently beta data that you can take a look at. Um, so look for ICE Investigators at CosmoQuest under the Do Science tab, and you can go back to searching for ICE. Um, so I also see uh, Lee and Denniston ask a second question. He asked, habitats on the moon, assuming perfect political conditions, we know that won't ever happen, uh, what would be the soonest we might see something, um, it, I, I think he's asking when is the soonest we might see a permanently habit habited um, scientific station on the moon, and would it be possible now? Um, Nancy, you've been looking at the moon for a lot lately. Do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Uh, given NASA's kind of uh, really tight budget, I, it's really hard to predict anything like that. Um, uh, the timing for when the, the space launch system will be done, of course, that's in flux. I believe one of the first test flights is in 20. 15 or 16, does anybody confirm that for me? And, uh, you know, when it's actually going to be able to go somewhere, uh, whether that's to an asteroid or to the moon or, uh, you know, the ultimate destination seems to be Mars, but um, that's really all in flux. And as far as uh, building a human base or a permanent base or a short-term base, um, again, it's uh, it's really impossible to say. I guess all those things are at least 10 years out from whenever the starting point is. It just seems to, to keep moving out. Um, I did an interview with Paul Spudis, uh, um, I believe, last fall. And he had a great idea for kind of a cislunar um, system of how we could uh, both uh, mine the moon and, and bring stuff back and and just kind of have a, a constant system of, of going traveling to the moon and, and taking things back and forth um, that it's a great idea and it uh, from his calculations it was a fairly uh, you know financially easy way to do it or or not so expensive that it that it just wouldn't make it impossible but whether that's in the uh, mindsets of the people in Congress that make those kind of decisions, I don't know. Um, again, it's, um, it's, it's really hard to predict something like that. It's definitely something that we've all dreamed about and hoped about and, and all that. Whether we can put those hopes and dreams into something concrete is, is another matter. I was going to say uh, the first SLS unmanned test flight is uh, somewhere around the end of 2017, uh, but uh, in terms of manned flights, uh, the development schedule doesn't call for that until somewhere around 2022. Uh, meanwhile, uh, SpaceX is working on their Falcon Heavy launch vehicle, and at, at one time, SpaceX has said that they hope to have the first uh, test flight of the Falcon Heavy uh, around the end of this year, but it, it's a little bit unpredictable, uh, as Elon Musk always says, uh, rocket science is freaking hard. So uh, I, I wouldn't uh, lay a bet on the Falcon Heavy being ready by the end of the year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the idea is that a couple of Falcon Heavy flights would be able to put a substantial payload on, on the moon. My guess is that if you're going to talk about some sort of uh, space station on, on the moon, the first space station is not going to be for humans. It's going to be for robots uh, that uh, you could have uh, you could theoretically have some sort of base that uh, roving robots could could operate from, and uh, a lot of the work of preparing the ground for operations on the moon could be done uh, robotically. Uh, some people have talked about having a human-tended station actually in orbit around the moon to, to watch over the robots down below. And so right now, that's kind of the leading scenario for, for getting to the moon and, and doing operations there. But I, uh, yeah. 
Go ahead. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the robots on the moon because there's this <laughs> fa fabulous article that, that I encourage all of you to Google. Um, I, I wish I remember who wrote it, but if you Google Japanese robot colony moon, there's this fabulous article about how the Japanese are actively planning to have a colony of robots for robots, constructed by robots who ride robots, who, who, are, who are basically doing all the things that, that astronauts um, can't do as safely. And, and so you see like armed and legged humanoid robots riving, riding around on rovers and other stationary robots constructing things. And it's just a fabulous idea that's actually in the works. And, and we also have to remember, while we're thinking US-centric and, and Dragon Capsule and, and NASA, um, the Russians and the Chinese also both have their own plans to go back to the moon. And what's amazing is China has this huge industrial complex. And they're very quiet about what they do. But they've been testing space station capsules. They've, they've been launching humans very quietly in the background and, and making good progress on, on advancing their own um, space force to go out and, and maybe even beat us all back to the moon. So um, Nancy, you, you were mentioning that you have some things uh, on Kepler you'd like to bring up. Yeah, uh, Kepler wasn't the only winner in as far as getting a mission extension. And this extension was came about from a senior review, which takes place every two years. And, uh, you know, NASA does this every couple of years just to kind of review all the missions that they have and, and which are the most successful and that kind of thing. Um, the senior review, um, a lot of times some of the weakest missions uh, can get cut because of this. But this this year, they reviewed nine missions, and they were they all got like you know an A plus grade or something. It was uh, the the people who did the review said that all of the missions should, should continue, and so um, the other missions that they reviewed were the Hubble Space Telescope, and of course that's going to continue at the uh, currently funded levels. <clears throat> Chandra is also going to keep going, as well as Fermi, which has been extended through um, 2016, and uh, Swift, as well as Kepler, going through through 2016 as well. And then NASA said that they will continue support of Planck and um, Suzaku and XMM Newt um, through 2015. So uh, that's, that's good news for the, uh, the astrophysics missions that NASA has and, and uh, the world has. And, and what's, what's really awesome about this is these are missions that, between the group of them, allow us access to the entire electromagnetic spectra. This is all the colors of light and radiation coming from, from objects uh, beyond our atmosphere, or at least beyond the orbits of these spacecraft. And they're not, with the exception of Planck, which, which is very much designed to look at the cosmic microwave background, um, they can be used for planetary within the solar system. They can be used uh, for extragalactic. They can be used for stars. So there's a whole host of different types of scientists who can use these missions to do their work. Now, Kepler is a very specialized spacecraft, but we're finding all sorts of new and interesting things to do it. And, and Phil Mawat um, puts, puts forward a really interesting idea. He, he asks, could Kepler spot a solar sail created by an extraterrestrial intelligence? How could you prove that the signal might be a solar sail, considering you need three viewings of a planet to show it's probably a planet? And, and I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion, opinions on this. I have silence. I, well, I just had, I needed to unclick my uh, mute button here, but uh, I think that uh, since Kepler really is designed to look for Earth-scale objects, you would have to have a solar sail that was as as big as uh, the Earth and reflecting somehow in the right way, and and also having some sort of reliable. Basically, you would be looking for a planet that just happened to be a big disk of a solar sail. So theoretically it's possible, but I think it'd have to be pretty big to, to be seen. Um, I think, uh, when I think of solar sail, I think of using it as you know, transportation, so it wouldn't necessarily be orbiting in planet-like orbit anyway. 
floating around the solar system. I would say dipping, but I guess you don't necessarily get get that fast. Um, but I, I, you'd see it um, moving around that extra solar system. Um, yeah. Again, I think yeah, just they would have to be huge at that point to really see. I, and I, I noticed, uh, just to anticipate you, Pamela, uh, someone else had a question about the search for exomoons using Kepler. Uh, again, if it's something that's Earth-sized, uh, that happens to be a moon of a giant planet, uh, theoretically you would be able to detect it, but you'd really have to tease out uh, a lot of the variables involved in, in being able to determine, first of all, that you have a big planet going over the disk of a star, and then trying to find that component of the uh, dimming of a star that's responsible, that a, a, an exomoon would be responsible for. And then uh, there's the question of how you would actually be able to confirm uh, that what you're seeing is being caused by a moon. In the case of planets, the Kepler team takes a lot of time to, to go to ground-based telescopes or, or do transit timing or use these sophisticated techniques to ensure what they're seeing is really a planet based on the influence of its mass. And so I think it'd be more uh, complicated to do that with a moon, but theoretically it could be done. And so with an extended mission, uh, you might see the folks at Kepler thinking, well, let's go after this and see if we can do it. So, so one of the... Um Surefire ways to find exomoons is unfortunately extraordinarily difficult and relies on luck and, and scientists don't like to rely on luck. And, and so right now the only way we really know to discover exomoons is to look for an effect called gravitational lensing. So this is where you have a background star and a foreground star passes in front of it. And if you get lucky, the foreground star goes in front of it, gravitationally causes the background star's light to get much, much, much brighter. And then a little bit later, as that star continues to orbit through our galaxy, its planet passes directly in front of that background star, causing its light to get not as gravitationally lensed, but still gravitationally lensed. And in the case of a truly perfect alignment, you might also get a, a little tiny spike from, from a moon. But the number of alignments that have to be absolutely perfect, the the it's just not a likely way, but it's the one surefire way we know that, that we can get a detection that we know is actually a moon. But like I said, it's really difficult. Um, so there's lots of complications out there. Now, going back to the comments list, we, ha we have uh, Mark Var Stargazer uh, asking... Yeah, Stargazer. <laughs> um, Virginia guy. <laughs> so I don't know if you heard Nicole in the background. It's VA um, Stargazer. I turned him into a variable star astronomer because that's my preference. Um, it, it said that uh, he was asking in the EPO event, why don't we see more naked uh, eye supernovas like Tycho's and Kepler's and there's all these named supernovas from the past. Why aren't we seeing those today? Anyone want to give that one a shot? Or I can take it. Um, it. It's just a matter of probabilities. I mean, the 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 statistics say that every galaxy, is, like our own spiral galaxy, is likely to have one big bright supernova every hundred years. So this also means that if you observe a hundred spiral galaxies for one year, in all those hundred spiral galaxies, you're only going to see one supernova, and that's if you're lucky. Now, the reason I say that is sometimes when the supernovae go off, they're um, obscured by dust, they're, you're looking at an edge-on galaxy and the supernova is back here somewhere hiding, and when you're embedded in the galaxy that you're observing, the probability that the supernova is hidden behind something increases all that much more. And so we suspect that there have been supernova in recent times, but they're probably just obscured from our view. So you figure we're due one every hundred years. And if we can't see all of them, we may not see one but every 400 years or so. We kind of have to guess at the statistics. So it's just a matter that we appear to live in an unlucky time or a lucky time because if you think about it, um, there's always the chance that there's some white dwarf ready to go supernova because it's sucking material off of its nearby neighbor and we don't know it exists and it's a little too close for comfort. That's always a fear. And uh, luckily, all of the big supernova uh, progenitor stars that we know about are all far enough away that we're safe. So, so 
hopefully the next one that goes off will be at a good distance and if we get lucky maybe it'll be something like Betelgeuse or Eta Carina. Yeah, um, th and we're, we're two-thirds of the way out in the spiral, right? And so looking through most of the galaxy, you have dust. And a lot of the supernova detections are done in the visible. I think if we once, it may be that once um, more radio all-sky, all-the-time surveys are online, you can start to d you can maybe detect the radio afterglows um, of, you know, but again, if it's once every hundred years, I, it's hard to say when the next one will be. Yeah, I, I, I would say it's the dust. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything they want to add? So, so we also have um, out. We we have any. We have a question from Stefan de Decker. Um, does anyone know anything about the Bright constellation? It's a mission like Kepler, Corot, and most. It's nano satellites with uh, photometers, um, per, and it has participation by Canada, Austria, and Poland. Austria will launch the first two nano sats soon. Has anyone heard of this? It looks like a pretty cool project. So, so we now have things to, to cover in future weekly space hangouts. Yeah. Well, I, I think things are, are wrapping up at this point in the show. I would like to thank all of you. Oh, go ahead, Alan. Oh, I was just going to say uh, that uh, next week uh, we'll be getting into Yuri's night season. And so uh, it's a good reminder that, that uh, to check out the yurisnight.net website and uh, see what's going on in your neck of the woods. In fact, I think that the, the uh, activities get underway today with uh, some events in Romania, but it's uh, April 12th, that's the 40th anniversary, not the 40th, the 51st anniversary of uh, Yuri Gagarin's first uh, space flight. Uh, the the uh, holiday was created on the 40th anniversary, and so it's been going on for uh, 11 years. This will be the 12th year, and so it's uh, a fun thing, and uh, we'll probably be talking more about that uh, next week because uh, we'll have this hangout right on April 12th, the anniversary. And this is Global Astronomy Month, so uh, go out, look up, and visit the Astronomers Without Borders website to find out about other uh, events that are happening near you. And this week in particular is the Lunar Astronomy Month. The moon should be beautifully visible towards twilight. And uh, go check it out. And remember, we all share one sky, and these are global celebrations. And so find someplace local to share the sky with a few people in real life instead of just sharing it here in the Hangout. But we would like to thank you for being here in the ha Hangout with us this week. P please remember to plus one the feed, uh, share it on Twitter, and just let us know that you're out there and let other people know that this exists. I, I have to thank Fraser Kane for setting this up for all of us. I am here as his noble substitute while he's off enjoying a, a much deserved vacation. And he will be returning, I believe, in two weeks' time to, to take over the reins. But for now, I would like to thank uh, all of you who were able to help me, Alan Boyle, Nancy Atkinson, Nicole Gugliucci. And uh, we will see you next week, same time, same place. And this Sunday night, for those of you looking for something to do, or at least Sunday night here in North America, adjust accordingly. We will be doing our uh, virtual star parties, and we hope to see the stars and you online Sunday evening. So thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. <laughs>